I grew up playing the harp. I always got volunteered to play the background music at all the wedding receptions. So one of my older cousins was getting married. I was playing the background music. It was lovely, blah, 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 you know, nice flowers, nice cake, nice dress, whatever. Anyways, uh, my attention span started to disappear and I decided to sort of break up the plane, break up the night. I would go to the restroom and then maybe the dessert table, I don't know, and then eventually go back and keep playing. Well, I got up and I went to the restroom and, and I walked out and I'm heading towards that dessert table when all of a sudden I noticed some people laughing. And at first I just thought I'd missed something, didn't think anything of it, maybe it was just their own conversation. But I kept on walking and some more people started laughing and pretty soon I started to wonder, well, what on earth is going on? What did I miss? And all of a sudden, my mom came running up to me and she said, Elizabeth, dear, you've tucked the back of your dress into your underwear. You might want to sort that out. Well, I was mortified. I ran into the bathroom and hid in the stall the rest of the evening. And finally, at the end of the evening, my mom came in and she said, Elizabeth, come on, you need to come out. You know, we've already packed up the harp. We're all waiting for you. Let's go home. And I just remember crying to my mom saying, I can't. I'm so embarrassed. My mom, she said, come on. It's not that big of a deal. It was a simple mistake. You know, all, think of it. All the, all the people that are here, at least, at the very least, half of them are women. Probably more because, well, weddings, women, you know. So all those women that were there, they understand completely what you're going through between underwear and nylons and slips and puffy dresses. That is just a lot of layers to maneuver. It's, it's okay, they understand. And the other half, they're just boys, who cares? That just did not make me feel any better. And she kept saying, you know what, the world will continue to move on, and as long as you had on clean underwear, you'll be fine. <laughs> I did, but that didn't make me feel any better. <clears throat> so, <laughs> I remember finally getting into the car and telling my parents that I never wanted to see any of the family ever again because I was so embarrassed. The people that I should be least embarrassed around. And having that number of family, having that large of a family, it is a really difficult task. I mean, you have to like consciously try to avoid people when you're related to that many people. I think I made it a week, and probably to this day, that's probably a record. Anyways, back to this mountainside. I mean, that's just who I was, so easily embarrassed, so shy. And so having a complete stranger try to undress me and sponge bathe me, I'm sure you can imagine how I would have felt. I mean, that was just the last thing in the world that I would have been okay with. And I remember grabbing hold of the buttons on my pajamas and clamping my elbows down next to my torso so that she couldn't take them off. And she did not like that at all. And she told me that if I didn't let her do this, she would have Emmanuel, which, by the way, was the name of the man as I knew him at that point in time. Um, she told me he would come in and he would rip my pajamas off me. So if I didn't want that, then I needed to let her undress me. Wow. <sighs> Times how I already felt by, I don't know, infinity. And that would be about how I felt about him coming in there, or really coming anywhere near me. So I, I begged with her and I pled with her, telling her I'd showered last night, I wasn't dirty, just give me what you want me to put on, I'll put it on, just don't touch me, I can do it myself. She finally gave in, which at that point in time, I did not realize what a big deal that was. But she finally just passed me this long robe, just like a robe she had on, and told me to put it on. So I did, and she had me take off all my clothes uh, underneath. And then she picked up all my clothing, and she got up and she walked out of the tent. Well, I started looking around this tent and wondering, 
why was this happening to me? What was going to happen next? Why would they make me wear this strange robe? And I remember as I was looking around, I remember seeing um, those foamy camping pads that you sleep on in the tent. And I remember seeing sheets and blankets and pillows. And I remember having this thought that these people had been here for quite some time already. I mean, that this was a really well thought out camp, a, a very well prepared camp. And in the meantime, the tent door unzips and in walks this man. And he changed out of the dark clothes that he'd initially kidnapped me in into a robe, just like the one I had on, just like the one the woman had on. And he knelt down next to me and he started to speak to me. Well, to be truthful with you, I really, really couldn't even begin to pay attention to what he was saying because I had just been kidnapped. I had just been taken out of my bed. I, I mean, taken out of my home, my world, I felt like had just been snatched away from me. And so I wasn't paying attention to what he was saying, but finally something inside me said, you probably should listen. You should probably see what he's saying uh, so that you know what's going on, so that you can, I don't know, find a way to get home or escape or talk to these people and, and help them realize what they've done. Because on the way up, the couple of times that we spoke, I begged and pled with him to let me go. And he'd always say, I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm not going to get caught. I know what the consequences are. And I'm still going to do this. So, I mean, that hadn't worked. So I felt like I should listen to what he said. And I only heard the last sentence that he said, which probably was the worst sentence that he said. And I don't, I will never forget it. He said, I hereby seal you to me as my wife before God and his angels as my witnesses. Oh, well, wow. <laughs> Out of everything I expected to hear, that was so far beyond. That was just completely out of my range of what, of anything. And I remember just screaming out, no, because how could that be okay? How could he think he could do that? I mean, I was 14 years old and looking at me, I probably looked like I was 10. I mean, I didn't look old. It was not hard to tell I was a little girl. How could he do that? And, and when I screamed out, no, he looked at me and he said, if you ever scream out like that again, I will kill you. And I remember telling him I, I wouldn't scream out again, but he had to see why this wasn't okay. He had to understand this. I mean, all of the reasons that I'm sure everyone can think of were all the reasons I tried to explain to him why this wasn't okay. And every time I came up with an excuse, he'd come back with the same retort, which was, in God's eyes, we're married, and it's time for us to consummate our marriage. Well, as I mentioned, I not only looked young, but I was young. I mean, I grew up in a very sheltered environment, a very protected um, household, you could say. I mean, my parents were very strict with all of us and very protective of all of us. And at that point in my life, I'd never heard that word before. And I remember thinking what on earth does he mean? And I had this thought come to my mind of what it could possibly mean. And I remember thinking, no, there's no way one human being could do that to another human being. There's just no way at all. And I remember just begging and pleading with him still, but nothing I said or did made a difference. And he finally just forced me onto the ground where he raped me. And when he was finished, he got up, turned around and, and left. And I'll never forget how I felt lying there. I felt so filthy and so broken and so completely shattered. I just felt that what would ever be the point of being rescued? Because no one could ever want to have anything to do with me now. No one could ever want any part of me now because I was so broken. I was so dirty. 
And I remember just lying there and thinking about stories that I'd seen on the news of other children who had been kidnapped and raped, but their stories always ended that they were immediately killed afterwards. And I remember sitting there, well, lying there thinking they were the lucky ones because they would never have to live another moment longer feeling this pain and this embarrassment and this shame and just feeling so terrible inside. They were lucky. And I ended up falling asleep thinking those thoughts. And when I woke up, there was this man and he was kneeling over me again. But this time he had a thin piece of metal cable and he was wrapping it around my ankle and then he was crushing bolts into place so that I couldn't run away. And honestly, if I could have sunk any lower in that moment, I did. I mean, if there was anything lower than rock bottom, I hit it. <clears throat> I remember standing up to see what I was connected to and it was, I, it was connected to a tree and it was just far enough for me to be able to lie down inside the tent and just far enough for me to reach the bucket that was used as a toilet. And that was as far as I could reach, maybe 12, 15 feet at the most. And that's probably being more than general. No, I'd say it was between 10 and 12, really. But we'll say between 12 and 15. Anyways, that doesn't matter. Sorry, I get so sidetracked sometimes. Um, <clears throat> I remember looking at this cable and just wondering... How long would I live for? This camp was so well hidden. It was so well stocked. I was chained up. Clearly, they didn't want me to run away. Clearly, they didn't want anybody to find us. How long would I be with them? Would it be a year? Would it be a few weeks? Would it be many years? What if it was so long that I forgot who I was, that I forgot my name because they had immediately told me I was no longer Elizabeth. And they immediately told me I could no longer talk about my family or my life before. They basically told me that my life began the moment he kidnapped me. And they said that from that moment forward was really the only thing I could talk about. And what if I forgot who I really was? And that thought really, really scared me. So I started to think of everyone and everything that was important to me. And at the very top of that list, my mom. She came to my mind. She was the one person who more than anything, I didn't want to forget. I didn't want to forget anything about her. The way she looked, the way she sounded, the way she smelled, the way that I, I felt when she'd hold me, just so safe, just like no one could ever hurt me. And <clears throat> I started to think of all of the things that she used to say to me, all of the things she used to tell me to do, things I'm sure many of you have told or do tell your children, or maybe you are being told on a daily basis, like, have you done your homework yet? Have you done your chores yet? How about your practicing? Okay, be home by 5.30 for dinner, blah, 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 blah. And as I sat there, trying to just absolutely engrave each of these memories on my brain. I had one very specific memory come to mind. One day I'd come home from school and I was very upset. And my mom had asked me why I was so upset. And I told her that I'd been sitting at lunch at, uh, with a group of my friends and the most popular girl in the school came over to our table. And she said, oh, this weekend, we're having a party at my house, and you're all invited. Well, except you. You're not invited. <laughs> well, I felt crushed. I mean, why did she not want me there? Fair enough. I mean, we weren't friends. Maybe it was a stretch to call us acquaintances. But all the same, why would she not want me there? I just, I couldn't understand it. I mean, she, there were other girls that she knew as little as, as me that were sitting at the table. I mean, why, why didn't she single one of them out or, or at least pick on a couple of us? <clears throat> and I just felt so bad about that. And my mom, she, she came back to me and she said, Elizabeth, you know, <sighs> these girls that you were sitting at a table with, are, are they your true friends? Wouldn't a true friend say, come on, Elizabeth, I'll hang out with you, or we'll have our own party, or we'll go to the movies, or I don't know, eat half a gallon of ice cream together. Isn't that what a true friend would say? And besides, is it really going to be so terrible spending a weekend at home with me? And you know what? <clears throat> on, 
on second thought, <sighs> popular, well, it really is just another word for rude. So just don't think about it. You're fine. Don't let them make your happiness. You make your own happiness. Well, none of those things made me all that happy, to tell you the truth. I mean, it said I had bad friends, I had a non-existent social life, and, well, every other girl in the junior high aspired to be rude. Not exactly happy thoughts. <laughs> she went on and she said, you will meet so many people in your lifetime, and... People will make their opinions, and sometimes you won't always understand them. I mean, sometimes you'll wonder, you know, why does this person not like me? And sometimes you'll wonder, oh, why does this person like me? But you know, of all these opinions that are made, of all these people that you meet, there's really only going to be a few that are truly important. Now, the first person that's the most important is God, and he loves you. And he'll never turn his back on you. Only you can turn your back on him. <clears throat> the second person who is most important, well, that would be me. And I love you. And I always will. Nothing can ever change that. No matter where you go or what you do, you'll always be my daughter and I'll always want what's best for you. And always remember that. And as I sat on this mountainside, I remembered it, and I realized that she was right. I realized that it didn't matter. All of these things that had happened to me, as terrible as they were, it wouldn't make a difference to her. She would still love me. I would still be her daughter. She would still want the best for me. And when I made that realization, I realized that, yes, my dad would still love me. Yes, my siblings, well, they didn't really have a choice. But we would still be a family, and even if I died and never saw them again, they would still be my family, and they would still love me. And when I realized that, I knew that I had something worth surviving for. It made all the difference in that world, that one realization, because that helped me make the decision that no matter what happened to me, no matter what lay in front of me, I would do whatever I had to if it meant that I would survive, if it meant that I had a chance of one day going back home and living with my family again, even if that meant doing whatever it took with these two people, these two monsters for the next 30 years, waiting until they died. <clears throat> if that's what it took, in my mind I was preparing myself for that because my family was worth it. Thank goodness it didn't take 30 years. <laughs> I, don't, I hope I would have made it, but you never know. <laughs> Maybe I would have broken, I'm not sure. Um, but that decision saw me through so much, and it <laughs> saw me through nine months of so much, really. And I'll never forget the day that I was rescued. Nine months later, well, during that time, we'd ended up going to California, um, actually, not too far from here, a um, little bit more south, but uh, we had decided, well, not we, really, not me. I had no say in anything, but my captors had decided to return to Utah, and we hitchhiked the whole way back, which, oh my goodness, do not recommend to anyone, but we made it. It was a good idea at the time. I thought maybe someone would recognize me or know something was off and maybe call the police or something. It was a good idea. <clears throat> but we finally made it, thank goodness. And we were walking up State Street in Salt Lake City, which is a pretty big street. It's very busy, um, very, very big, very big. That's really all I can say about it. And all of a sudden, there were police cars pulling up around us, and these police officers were jumping out of the car. And this was not the first time that we'd been approached by police officers. And my captors, well, firstly, I should probably say this is probably one of the most commonly asked questions I get is, you know, why didn't you say something if you were approached by officers? Why didn't you say something? Why didn't you scream or run or do something? And I think it's very important, actually, that I answer this question <clears throat> because I, it's true for me, but I know it's true for so many other victims and survivors out there. 
I didn't run and other survivors and victims don't run, not because we don't want to, because trust me, we want to more than anything in the world, but we've been so threatened and so abused for such a long time that these people who've hurt us, who control us, who've manipulated us, it's like they become invincible. Because I watched my two captors lie to people. I watched them steal, I watched them cheat. I mean, he kidnapped me out of my own home. He raped me, he chained me up. Nobody ever stopped him. Nobody ever stepped in and said, this isn't okay, you can't do that. I mean, no one had ever come to my aid. So when he said, if I ever said anything or did anything he didn't want me to do, he would kill me. I believed him because everything else he said, everything else he did, I mean, always went the way he said it would. So when he said, you know, say what I tell you to say, don't speak to the officers. And if you have to, you know, you t tell them this, tell them you're our daughter, tell them, you know, we're, we're street ministers and, and all this other stuff. So that's why I didn't immediately run and why I didn't immediately answer. Not because I didn't want to, just because I'd been so threatened for so long. And for me, I had every reason to believe this man and, and his wife that they do everything they said to me. And what if I did say who I was <clears throat> and they didn't believe me and they, they, they let us go? What would my captor do to me then? He, he probably would have killed me, I don't know. So that's why it was really self-preservation. So when, that, when the officers started talking to us, I didn't answer immediately. And finally, one of the officers noticed how uncomfortable I was. And so he said, well, let's just, let's just separate them. Let's just question her alone for a minute. So they took me just a few yards off and they started talking to me. And at first I kept giving them the answers that I'd been told just because I was so scared. And up until this point, you maybe could say that I did not have a whole lot of faith in other people because no one had helped me up until this point. But finally, the officer looked at me and said, you know, there's a girl and she's been gone for a very long time now and her parents miss her so much and they've never stopped looking for their, they've never given up hope on her, they've never stopped loving her, they want her to come home. Don't you want to go home now? And it was only then in that moment that I finally found the courage to admit who I was. And then he handcuffed me and put me in the back of the police car. That didn't instill much confidence either. But <clears throat> we did make it back to the police station. I was eventually unhandcuffed. And I was brought to this little tiny room and it didn't have any windows. It just it was like the size of a closet. It had one little sofa in there and they left me alone in there. I didn't know what was going to happen. In my mind I started thinking, "Oh my word, they are going to send me to prison." They think I'm guilty. They didn't even let me call my parents. Isn't that one of my rights? Don't I get a phone call? If they thought I was innocent, wouldn't they have taken me home or picked up my parents on the way or let me talk to them or something? They did handcuff me. They must really think I'm guilty. <laughs> I'm going to prison. <laughs> Shoot. <clears throat> well, prison. Let's think. You have a ceiling and um, you've got a bed, your own bed. It's not like you have to share a bed with anyone. And you've got food guaranteed every single day. And maybe you don't get a shower every day, but you probably get a shower a few times a week, which is more than what I've experienced in the last nine months, maybe once. I don't know, but I did stink pretty bad. <clears throat> and I, as I sat there thinking about all these things, all these luxuries that were available in prison, I started to think, oh, right, well, prison doesn't sound all that bad, actually. You know what? No matter what happens, from here on out, things can only go up. I mean, things really can't get any worse than where I've been. And right as, right as I made that realization, right as I kind of came to that conclusion, the door just 
flew open and my dad came running into the room. He just looked at me for a second and he came over and he picked me up in the biggest hug you can imagine. And he just started crying. So of course when he cries, I start crying. But <clears throat> he said, Elizabeth, is it really you? And I think I went into shock for a minute because <sighs> everything had just happened so fast without any forewarning. It took me, once again, a minute to respond. Either that or I'm just a little bit slow. It could be that one as well. <clears throat> Anyways, I did eventually respond to him. And I just remember as he sat there holding me, it was the happiest moment of my life. And I just knew that whatever lay in front of me, whatever, whatever might happen, it was going to be okay because no matter what, my dad was going to be there and he was never going to let anyone hurt me ever again the way that these two people had hurt me the last nine months. I knew it was going to be okay.